Welcome to Reader Meet Writer, Okra Pick, featuring Susan Beckham Zarenda with her new book, Bells for Eli. We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction during this hour. I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And now to today's writer. After teaching literature, composition, and creative writing to thousands of high school and college students for 33 years, Susan turned her attention to putting a novel in her heart on paper. The genesis of which started with a short story that won a fiction prize some years ago. She was delighted to present her debut novel, Bells for Eli, to readers on March 2nd, 2020. During her years of teaching at Spartanburg Community College, and then as an AP English teacher at Spartanburg High School, Susan published short stories and won numerous regional awards, such as the South Carolina Fiction Prize twice, the Porter Fleming Competition, the Southern Writers Symposium Emerging Writers Fiction Contest, the Hub City Hard Agree Contest in Fiction, Alabama Conclave First Novel Chapter Contest, and the Jubilee Writing Competition twice. Since 2018, she has published six stories in literary magazines. Well, that's an accomplishment, Susan. Thank well, you. <laughs> we're so glad to have you here and we're so glad to have Bells for Eli in the world. Tell us more. Okay, I am absolutely delighted to be here today and I thank all of you for being in the, on the screen, and I thank Wanda and Linda Marie and Nikki and the whole SEBA team, and I'll talk a little bit about Bells for Eli, read a couple of short passages, and then would, would love to answer questions. So I'm going to start out by asking, you may not all be of a <clears throat> certain age as I am, but I'm going to start out by asking, who recalls eating moon pies in the sun with chocolate dripping down your fingers at the local swimming pool? <laughs> while the eagle touched down on the moon's tranquility base. Yes. Or do you remember junior high parties where black lights made our teeth glow green while Agent Orange, unfortunately, laid waste to the jungles of Vietnam? Or, okay, I was there making out at drive-in movies in high school while the hippies were gathering for love-ins in Golden Gate Park. Well, this was my era a contradictory time that teeters between devotion to conventional values from the 60s and, excuse me, from the 50s and the desire to do what you feel in the 60s and 70s. So in Bells for Eli, the town where my main characters live and other settings, they are largely imagined, but they are based on the realities of my time and locale of my own youth. My main characters, Adeline called Delia Green, and Ellison called Eli Winfield. They live in the fictitious small town of Green Branch, South Carolina during this momentous period and they are deeply affected by their time and place. Um, my novel is actually inspired by a real incident, something that happened to my first cousin Danny when he was very young on his second birthday. And as is the case in the novel with my character Eli, my cousin saw a Coca-Cola bottle sitting on the porch steps at his home and he drank from it. But instead of it having Coca-Cola inside, it had Red Devil Lie. And Red Devil Lie has chemical properties like helium, I've learned from my research. And so according to what my parents told me when I was a child, my uncle, my father's brother, was using that chemical to blow up balloons for Danny's birthday. So like Eli in my novel, my cousin survived his accident, but his life was forever changed. Now, unlike Eli's cousin, Adeline, that is Delia Green, who's the protagonist of the novel and the speaker of the novel, I did not grow up in the same town as my cousin. And most of what I know of his challenging childhood came to me secondhand long after my own childhood. So my novel is largely an imagining of Eli and Delia growing up across the street from each other in a small town, South Carolina neighborhood. And as Delia becomes Eli's defender against bullies and tormentors who mock his frailty and his physical disfigurement, 
they develop a deep and uncommon love as they come of age in this powerfully transitional time of American history. So I'm going to read a little scene when Delia and Eli are preteens. And at this point, he, he does look pretty normal. The tracheotomy in his throat is gone. The tube in his stomach is gone. He is getting you know, to be a stronger young man. Well, they're returning from a walk um, to the creek behind Magnolia Manor, which is Eli's grandmother's antebellum home out in the country. Eli suggests that they climb up to the hayloft to look out across the land as day begins to dwindle. And there, verbally and physically, he proclaims his feelings for his cousin. Let me read you this little scene. It gives you an idea about the bond that forms between them. So I just gotta find it. Did I put it on the wrong page? Here it is. At least an hour of light remained after we ate our supper. Egg salad sandwiches kept cool with a plastic bag of ice, blueberries, chips, a thermos of tea, and packed the plastic dishes and flatware back into the basket. Eli wanted to walk back by way of the barn. It housed horses once upon a time, but was now entirely storage full of hay. Eli set the basket on the ground at the entrance. Let's climb into the loft. It's a great lookout from up there. You can see all over. He meant looking out of the opening at the south gable end. The other sides were walled in. I'd never climbed the ladder into the loft. You go first. I'm behind you, he directed. I'm not afraid of heights, but I did wonder if the old ladder would hold, if it might be rotten. I tested the bottom rung by jumping on it. Well, there's hay stored up there, so people like pot go up and down it all the time, Eli said. I climbed up and piled into the itchy hay. This is great, Eli said, heaving himself over the last rung and plopping down beside me. Feel the breeze coming in? Look, and you can see all the way past the tree line to the creek and beyond. And I could. It was marvelous. A place above that seemed a world belonging only to Eli and me. He moved close beside me and peered out into the late light. We sat on our knees, looking out into the world his ancestors had farmed starting more than a hundred years before. He put his hand in my hair, startling me. I jumped. His hand remained. Like bright pennies, he said. He pulled my hair playfully. He grasped it in his fist. You're beautiful, Delia. Clumsily, he turned me toward him. I remained on my knees, bewildered, awkward without words to respond. I was no longer gazing out on the open pasture, but facing him. Your eyes are like cat's eyes, he said. There was no teasing in his voice. The color changes, sometimes green, sometimes sort of gold. He moved his hands to my face. He put his thumbs on my eyebrows. Not only that, you always look determined. He paused. Let me kiss you, he said, on the lips. Cousins aren't supposed to kiss like that, I said. They used to, he said. I nodded. Inside, my heart beat fast, feathers flurrying in my chest. Um, later, when he is completely normal on the outside, tubes are gone, tracheotomy's gone, he bolts, This Eli bolts into adolescence. He is a heartbreaker with a double standard because he guards Delia's vulnerability when she ventures into a destructive romantic relationship. And determined as Eli is to rescue his beloved cousin from her boyfriend's ulterior motives, Delia is equally committed to saving Eli when he falls into the wrong crowd enamored with drugs. The cousin's relationship grows into an incomparable love, blossoming into an intimacy that cannot be because they both know to love one's cousin in that way is taboo. Now, during my own adolescence, I saw more of my real life first cousin than I had as a child, um, because by that time we, we lived about an hour apart. I was in the small town of Lancaster, South Carolina, and he was in the big metropolis of Charlotte. 
uh, North Carolina. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't grow up with him. And so, as I said, it's, it's, I didn't witness the day-to-day -day life that my cousin lived. And I have simply imagined a life in Eli, similar to the, my cousin became a very charismatic and handsome young man. And so I gave my character Eli a self-assured and generous nature, like my cousin. And an interviewer asked me um, not too long ago why I decided to write about a socially taboo relationship. Well, the question sort of stunned me because what happens to Eli and Delia is a natural evolution. It is not something I planned. It just is the logical and inevitable outcome of the deep bond that they have with one another from the time they're very young. And I didn't start out to write about romantic uh, feelings developing between first cousins. In fact, I didn't know Delia and Eli's relationship was going in that direction until it happened. Their unbreakable connection in childhood advances into adolescence and each one is determined to protect the other at any cost. It's, it's unconditional love or something close to it. So one night when they drive home after a dance and Eli parks the car to tell Delia a secret about himself and a girl he dated because he believes that revelation might keep his beloved cousin from a similar fate. These cousins just showed me their intimate feelings. It was a natural progression. Neither I nor they could escape. In fact, one of the big tensions in the book is their understanding that they are not free to act on their feelings and, and how they try to cope with that. Well, the cousins' lives um, in Bells for Eli from childhood through adolescence are affected not only by Eli's childhood trauma, but also these times in which they live. The counter-cultural activists of the 60s, as culturally um, significant as they were, in the small town South, they belonged to the margins of society. The mainstream, I, I grew up then, the mainstream in the typical small Southern town went about their business as usual. Fathers climbed the career ladder, mothers drove their children to school, the family ate dinner at pretty much the same time every night, um, living the American dream of home ownership and a nuclear family and social prestige. So as children of the 60s, Eli and Delia, like me, are members of the baby boom generation. And I wore my pen today, I'm gonna to do this, you can't read it, but it says, books are groovy. That is a word, we wore out that word groovy in the 60s. That's why nobody says it today. We all wore it out. Um, but anyway, the, the baby boomers were the largest single generation up to that point. Now, I understand the millennials might be uh, passing us by, but at that time, there were so many in my generation that our sheer numbers had an effect on popular, a tremendous effect on popular culture, and popular culture had an equally powerful effect on us. Um, we seem to have developed a greater generational consciousness than a lot of previous generations b before us. Um, and particularly, I'm just gonna pick one thing, particularly through music. Um, and though Delia's and Eli's musical taste um, sometimes intersect in the novel, uh, in the popular songs that they like, the differences in their preferences characterize the contrast between the status quo of the small town and the nonconformity of the counterculture that's on its way. Uh, emer emerging from the introduction of rock and roll in the 1950s that celebrated themes of young love and freedom. Again, how many of you remember Bill Haley and his comments and that anthem of rebellion, rock around the clock. And I happen to remember Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show filmed only from the waist up because his gyrating hips were way too much and had to be, had to be censored. So the 1960s music split among a number, number of genres, but the major divide, at least what I'll call it, was between soft and hard rock. Eli, he gravitates toward harder rock groups like Led Zeppelin, The Who, The Grateful Dead. His favorite songs are Stairway to Heaven and A Wider Shade of Pale. 
And it's with its emphasis on overt masculinity and sexuality, hard rock typifies Eli's behavior. And also in part because of his childhood trauma, um, Eli wants to escape his feelings. Consequently, he becomes a risk taker with a rebellious spirit and hard rock music aligned with the drug culture lures him. Now, I want to read one more passage. Um, and this, I think, will help you see his attraction to the song, Stairway to Heaven. Eli reached into the console and retrieved a tape. He turned the ignition and inserted his eight track of Led Zeppelin IV. It started on Black Dog. I knew what was coming soon. The favorite song of Eli's life, Stairway to Heaven. He loved its aggression and emotion, unresolved and mystical. He loved it too because it was lonely. The tender opening chords began on the guitar. The recorders followed with their sweet and expectant melody, reminiscent of time long ago. I imagined Elizabethan maidens in brocade gowns tiptoeing about on a mossy forest floor. The radio will play this song forever. Other bands will play it, Eli said. It will last, mark my words. Not because of the lyrics, they're imprinted on your brain, but they're bullshit pompous. It's the music that matters. Listen. We leaned back into our seats. I closed my eyes. Eli reached for my hand. A minor, he whispered, haunting. It's the unknown flirting with you, like our Ouija board. I waited for the crescendo to build toward the long and dramatic guitar, and then the come down at the end, the near silence as the song faded. It's like life, Eli said when the song ended, tension and release. He squeezed my hand and let it go. He ejected the tape. Now, Delia, on the other hand, she typifies to a large degree the norm of the small town South in which she lives. Unlike her cousin, she likes soft rock. Songs with groups like Three Dog Night, and The Letterman. She even admits to liking bubblegum music. Many of you will not know what bubblegum music is, was. But I remember the 1910 Fruit Gum Company and the song Simon Says. Um, uh, bubblegum music was a, or I guess if you still listen to it, is a subgenre um, that contains seeming, seemingly childlike themes and contrived innocence. And the lyrics of these songs often featured themes of romantic love and personal happiness, references to sunshine and toys and sugary foods. It's just everything was good in the world with bubblegum music. Well, while Eli lets his hair grow long, even before his teen years, and he tells Delia he's going to be a hippie. She doesn't follow suit. She doesn't embrace drugs and the counterculture. Still, she's not completely content. She is not like her friend Neely, who feels secure in the way things are. Delia exhibits a desire for independence, beginning in grammar school, when she chooses a career outfit, not a house dress and apron such as her mother wears, for her Barbie doll. And I'm gonna show you all my muse. Here is Barbie from the 60s. She is wearing her airline stewardess outfit. And she sat on my shelf much of the time that I was writing the manuscript of Bells for Eli, looking over my shoulder saying, are you going back there? Do you know where you are? Um, so Delia, is, she doesn't have any real notion of the coming women's liberation movement, but she knows herself and she desires autonomy. So I'll conclude by saying Bells for Eli embraces the gamut of 1960s and 70s culture and the frictions between expected behavior and conduct in the small town south of this era and the burgeoning strains of rebellion and independence that emerge from the fringes of society at that time, parallel many of the tensions among characters in the novel, particularly between Delia and Eli in their late adolescence as the novel moves toward its dramatic conclusion and Delia discovers a shocking family secret that reveals truths about Eli she has never known. So I'm happy to answer questions.
Susan, that was wonderful. It is time for questions. Uh, it's important. It's important that y'all stay muted so we can all hear. Uh, in the chat option, please begin all your questions with a capital Q. Name your local store if you'd like, and we'll give them a shout out. Linda Marie, do we have a question for Susan? We do. Um, a fan of writing books on St. Simon's Island asks, what does your cousin think about being the person who is the inspiration for Eli? Well, I can't answer that because it would be a bit of a sort of a spoiler, maybe. But I will tell you what his sisters think. The book is dedicated to them, um, to my first cousins, Emma Beckham and Jeannie Beckham. And um, they, they uh, have supported this book 100% uh, of the way, and I am grateful for that. Um, so I'm going to answer it like that. Okay. Another question, and this is from a fan of Novel in Memphis, Tennessee. They asked, what happened to Eli when he drank the helium? Um, it's, it's very, it's, it's very laid out in the book. Um, it was it, interesting when I first wrote the scene, well, it, it burned, it, it burned his esophagus all the way down. And so he had to swallow a tube on and off uh, regularly for years to keep his whole digest, his whole esophagus open so that the scar tissue wouldn't close it up so that eventually one day he'd be able to eat. Um, normally, like a normal person. So he couldn't eat. And he had a tube in his stomach, a hole in his stomach with a tube in it, literally. And the tube would come out and his mother fed him pureed food through a turkey baster. Now, um, I consulted two gastroenterologists, one who practiced um, during that period of time, who's retired now, and then another um, somewhat younger, but just to get different perspectives. And because my agent said, this is a very unusual accident and the consequences of it are unusual. So when you write this, you need to get it exactly right. And I hope I have, I believe I have. Another, another viewer wanted to know more about your title and what that means. Okay. Eli is a musician. Um, he's a percussionist and he is obsessed with the sound of bells. He climbs some bell towers, he rings bells, but bells are also a central symbol in the novel. And I think we ring bells as a tribute to people too. And I hope in some ways that um, Delia is giving a tribute to Eli. So there, there are a lot of different sort of levels, I hope, that, that come out with bells. Another viewer um, asks, who are your writing influences? Um, well, a lot, I have a lot of writing influences. I, I love the Southern writers of the mid 20th century. I've been heavily influenced by Eudora Welty, by Flannery O'Connor, by Carson McCullers, by Katherine Ann Porter. I like a lot of living writers, um, Reynolds Price. I like a lot of living writers as well. I love the late Pat Conroy's work. Um, I love Ann Tyler's work. Uh, and, and it's not that I, I've only listed Southern novelists and, and that's not the case. You know, my favorite play always to teach was Hamlet because he always, he, he, he finally figures it out, you know, he finally understands life and it, sometimes it's really, really hard for us to get there. Mm -hmm. Another viewer asked, who would you like to see play Delia and Eli in a movie? Oh, wouldn't that be grand? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> um, I haven't really thought about it. Maybe it's because I don't want to jinx it and I hope maybe there will be a movie um, one day, I've had an idea about um, Mary Margaret, who is Eli's um, grandmother, aristocratic grandmother in the country. I, I have, we would have to add a few years to her, but I've wondered if Celia Weston wouldn't make a wonderful Mary Margaret Lauderdale. Um, but I, I haven't thought about characters for Eli and Delia because I guess I don't want to drink jinx it. Um. A fan of Copperfish Books in Punta Gorda, Florida, has read your book and loves it. Oh, thank you. 
and they want to know if you're writing another book right now. I actually have begun, and I had a lot of notes, but I have actually begun in the last few weeks uh, on that endeavor, and it will be a modern day book um, with three main characters, a teacher, I know a lot about being a teacher, a rather upper class um, young man in high school, white boy, and a an underprivileged girl, mm -hmm. probably biracial. So I'm going to put those three together and create, I hope, a novel in the mm -hmm. high school atmosphere and, and the clash of classes and what happens. Another viewer asks, having taught writing, what surprised you about writing a book? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I always preached rewriting to my students, whether they were writing essays or whether when I taught creative writing at the community college, they were writing short stories. I believe that rewriting is the real writing, but oh boy, did I do a lot of it. And I, I think I was kind of surprised at how much, not, I mean, the, the initial manuscript was okay, but it, I don't think I realized how much better I could make it. And I, I did a great deal of rewriting um, after I wrote the initial, initial manuscript, and I'm very glad that I did. Along the lines of teaching, another viewer asks, um, what grades of English did you teach, and are you retired from teaching now? I am retired from teaching. I retired in 2013, and I began a part-time job at that point as a book publicist doing the media for um, Magic Time Literary Publicity. My first two years of teaching were seventh and eighth grade, and I almost died. Oh, uh, I was 21, 22. Well, I, I worked for a year or two as a newspaper reporter, and then I started teaching because I wanted to have a family and I didn't want to work till 11 o'clock at night. And I will never forget the day, I won't name the young man, I can remember his name, but I was standing in front of the class and a red rubber ball hit me in the forehead. And I just stopped and I re went, walked over, you can't do this now, no, like it, this was 1978, you can't do this now. I walked over, I grabbed him by the shoulders, I shoved him up against the wall and I said, somebody in this room Please go to the principal's office and get somebody before I kill so-and-so. <laughs> anyway, after the second year of, of junior high, I went to the district office and I said, that's it for me. I've got to go up with the age. This is not meant for me. So I taught high school for several years, and then I taught full-time at the community college for 20 years. And then I came back to high school for the last 10 years of my career teaching AP English and loved every minute of it. I had the smartest students. Uh, they kept me on my toes 100% of the time. I might still be there if I could have graded another essay, but I couldn't grade any more essays. I wore out. <laughs> another viewer asks, what do you do if someone, your editor, or someone else reads your work and wants to completely change something, um, how do you deal with that part of the process? I didn't have that happen. Um, as I think I mentioned earlier, when, when my agent took the initial manuscript and there was this most unusual accident with Eli swallowing the lie, it was so unusual to her and she said, this, this is gripping, but I wanna make sure that you've got every detail right. So I need for you to go and interview not one, but two doctors. And at that point I did. I did um, make a significant plot change or enhancement. Um, Oh, I don't know. After the after my agent took the initial manuscript and we kept talking about something that needed to happen between Delia and Eli that would even a stronger bond, something that only they would know and nobody else in the world would ever know, something that would would bond them in a way that there was absolutely no separation possible. And I did write an entire subplot. Now that wasn't an editor's suggestion. That was my 
agent in, in me talking about it and and she's incredible she's uh, she's as much an editor as she is an agent I literally took a bicycle ride um, on flat ground mind you I rode my bicycle for 15 miles and I thought about it and I thought about what could I do what did I need to do and by the time I got back from that bike ride I had the subplot of a mystery in my head and I, mystery is, does not come easily to me. I would not want to be a mystery writer. But I had this subplot. I came into the house. I went straight for the computer. My husband starts talking to me about all these different things. I said, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. If, if, you, if, if I don't get this down right now, it'll be gone. But that subplot became a very important part of the novel. And I am so happy with it. Mm -hmm. I had had, I won't say... I was dissatisfied with the ending of the novel, but it just never felt perfect to me. And once mm -hmm. I incorporated that plot, that was, all of a sudden it all came together and it, it ended it, it exactly like it should. So that's a long answer, I'm sorry. That was a great answer. Um, so about your, the beautiful co cover of your book, how involved were you um, in the design? Actually, more than I thought I would be. Um, my publisher is the wonderful Mercer University Press, a bunch of fine folks. And when it came time for the cover, the publicist there emailed me and she said, now, we don't, are not necessarily going to take your ideas, but if you want to send us some ideas about the cover, then we will consider them. I, I sent various ideas. This, this was one of them. I sent a photograph of my great grandparents' home in Lancaster, outside the city in Lancaster, South Carolina, because that home is the model in my head for Magnolia Manor, where Eli's grandmother lives. You know, I thought about, well, I could go visit, um, you know, uh, somewhere, uh, an antebellum home, and, and I thought about doing that and researching and going through all the rooms and the nooks and the crannies, and all of a sudden I said, why? Why do I need to do that? when I've already got one in my head that I know inside out, upside down. So I sent the photograph and Mercer liked that. And their artist um, obviously did a beautiful artistic rendition of um, sort of just the little piece of the front porch of that house. Mm -hmm. Linda Marie, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry to say. Well, this is, this might be referencing the same home. Um, a fan of Hub City Bookshop ref is, speaks about a beautiful house on your website. Is that the same? It is. It is the same home. I just took it and ran with it. Uh, <laughs> there's a book trailer on my website, and um, it, it features uh, the Wade Beckham house, which is my great-grandparents' home. My great-grandfather bought that house in the late 1800s. And, yes, it is the same house. Mm -hmm. uh, I just... You know, it's since it is the model, most most of the places are imagined in the novel, but Magnolia Manor is modeled after that home. So I just said, Dad Gummit, I'll just put it on there. Thank you, Susan. That was wonderful. And if, well, what if fun of, for me. What I'm fun so for me. So glad. And if all of you enjoyed this as much as I did, please let your bookstore know and order Susan's book from them. We, yes. hope, we, we hope to be scheduling lots of authors, so be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions or ideas for how this could be better for you. And order Bells for Eli from them. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Linda Marie and Nikki. And this is Wanda signing off. <laughs>